In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. <clears throat> Most sacred heart of Jesus, Jesus, immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. St. Pius the Tenth, St. Pius V, pray for us. in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. I thought I would begin by just making a, a comment. If you recall, last month I gave a special presentation about what happened in the Vatican Gardens on October 4th, uh, this past October 4th, with the worship and the ceremony of the pagan idols. And I just wanted to close that off by telling you, it was soon after my talk, uh, I was talking to some of the gentlemen here uh, previous, just before, it was soon after the talk that Francis came out and defended it. He defended the worship of the idols by saying, comparing it to what St. Paul did. And he references the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. If you're familiar with Acts of the Apostles, um, that is a chapter where we read that St. Paul went to the city of Athens, Greece. It is the only reference we have in the whole of sacred scripture that anyone went to Athens. Athens was the capital of uh, Greek culture. It was the capital of Greek paganism, if you will, it was the capital of Greek philosophy. And what happened is St. Paul, we read, went to Athens. And as he was walking down the streets of Athens, he saw all these different temples dedicated to different pagan gods. There was one particular temple there called the Temple to the Unknown God. And you see, the Greeks had a temple set up in Athens to the unknown God because they were superstitious. The superstitious, by that I mean, they erected a temple to a God they didn't know because they were afraid if they left a God out of their pagan worship, he might take vengeance upon them. So they had this temple to the unknown God. And St. Paul said to them that he was there to preach to them the God they didn't know, who was the one true God. And he proceeded to preach to them about God, about Christ, his passion and death, and his resurrection. And when he talked about the resurrection, they didn't want to hear any more. They said, We're, we'll, hear, we'll hear more of this later. Uh, we read he was talking to the, these philosophers who were called Epicureans and Stoic philosophers. The Epicurean, both of them, they were like they were opposite philosophies. The Epicurean philosophy was all about get as much pleasure from this life as you possibly can, because when you die, that's it. There's no the soul is not immortal. The Stoics believed. If you want to be happy here, you can't be naturally, you can't smile anymore. You have to be, uh, like, control all your passions, kind of like uh, if you're familiar with uh, uh, someone who just, um, they never smile, they never laugh, nothing's funny, no sense of humor, nothing, just very un impassionate, nothing. The Stoics believed that's how we'll be happy. They too, though, denied a future life. There was no immortality of the soul, no future life. So when they heard St. Paul speaking about the resurrection, they, they didn't want to hear it. That was it. That was it. Francis said that when St. Paul went to Athens, he embraced their pagan culture before he preached Christ. He first embraced and imbibed, if you will, the paganism of Athens, which is a gross distortion of what really happened. That, though, was one of the defenses that he put up 
for the Pachamama ceremony in the Vatican, the worship of a pagan goddess that happened at the Vatican Garden and in the Vatican uh, itself. So I just wanted to mention that to just cap off this, this whole unfortunate experience here. But on the other hand, fortunate in a sense, because as I did mention last time, people who really love the truth and want to know the truth, though they're buried in the new church, if you will, they're just inundated with it. If they really love Christ and love the truth, they won't stay there. They will come to the one true Catholic faith. And um, I can tell you that uh, I've seen quite a, new fa- quite a few new faces at St. Pius of Chapel on various Sundays that I've been coming. Because people are looking. Well, when we left off, though, in our uh, talk here in the wake of Vatican II, um, I had concluded with the 1955 changes to the Holy Week. And how that was, uh, there is a connection between those changes and the eventual change in the, in the, uh, the promulgation of the new Mass. It was all connected. We pick up today on September 3rd, 1958, where an instruction on sacred music was issued by the Sacred Congregation of Rites. And this instruction on sacred music uh, extended the practice of the Dialogue Mass. And do you know what the Dialogue Mass is? Dialogue Mass is that the faithful were permitted to make responses with the servers during low mass. You know it was first introduced in 1922. The dialogue mass. It just wasn't extended throughout the whole church. Certain dioceses practiced it. Certain parishes did. My mother told me, she would, she grew up in the south side of Chicago. They had moved a few times in different parts of the city of Chicago. She had been a member of maybe two or three parishes growing up. She said, we never had a dialogue mass. Only the servers made the responses. Well, in 1958, it became more extended. It became a more common practice in many dioceses throughout the world that the faithful could make responses with the servers at the low mass. In some places I've read, they were even allowed to say the Gloria in the Credo with the priest. Some places even introduced, and this is as early as 1958, a practice called lay commentators. Lay commentators. And a lay commentator during the Mass While the priest was praying the Mass in Latin, this layman was reading the vernacular translation to the faithful in the pews. Perhaps some of you growing up, I don't want to point you out, (laughs) maybe, perhaps, you might have seen something, maybe not, I don't know, I don't know. I was rather surprised to see that. But again, it was another testing of the waters here. And notice I said September 3rd, 1958. That's one month before Pope Pius XII died. He was already very sick at that time. The stage, though, was set for greater and more revealing changes during the pontificate of John XXIII. It was June of 1960 that John XXIII appointed Anibali Bugnini, a name we are now very familiar with here. He appointed Bugnini to serve as the secretary of the Preparatory Liturgical Commission for Vatican II. 
And what that meant was he was going to assist in writing the council's decree or constitution on the sacred liturgy, which I told you in our Vatican II conferences, that constitution on the sacred liturgy was called Sacrosanctum Concilium. But while Bugnini was doing this, he was still very active, very active in his work on the liturgical commission, which was still going. And between the years 1960 and 1962, before Vatican II even got off the ground, Bugnini in the liturgical commission with the approval of the Sacred Congregation of Rites, and of course John the Twenty Third, who ultimately has to approve all of this, made a number of changes. And the changes were in three things. They were in the Roman breviary, of course the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, and the calendar, the universal calendar of the Church. The breviary, I believe I told you in our last conference, the breviary is the official prayer of the Catholic Church that every priest is obliged under pain of mortal sin to pray every day. It's that prayer he says for his people. And the breviary normally can take an hour and a half or so to say every day, an hour and 45 minutes, depending on the length of the office, we call it to be read and prayed. And I just want to mention, because I I don't want to get too involved here, uh, Father Bomberger, uh, you would understand more than anyone else <laughs> on these, some of the detailed changes he made in the breviary. Uh, but what he did, and one of the, the breviaries divided into Hours, seven hours. There's matins and lauds. There's prime, tierce, sext, known, vespers, and compline. The office of matins is nine psalms and usually nine lessons. Lessons. There's three lessons that are read from sacred scripture, three from the life of a saint or a sermon, and then The the third set of lessons of three is usually a gospel and a commentary by a father of the church. John the 23rd made the change to take out the writings of the fathers of the church from the Roman breviary. He wanted to make it shorter so that there were only nine psalms and three lessons that the priest read every day. He cut the breviary down. He cut other things out of the breviary, too, to make it shorter. And you know what's interesting to note is in his new breviary that he put forth when he he cut everything out, he said it's still his hope that the priest on his own, for his own spiritual nourishment, will take the time to grab a volume of the writings of the fathers of the church, St. Augustine or St. Basil the Great, St. Jerome, and he'll take that, and on his own time, the priest will will read that for his own nourishment. And I read that, I thought, well, the whole, why why not leave it in the breviary? The whole point in cutting the breviary, he said, was to give the priest more time to do pastoral work. Why would he then go on his own without any obligation and spend time reading from the fathers of the church. As a Monsignor from the Archdiocese of New York once told me, he says when they were, when they had their day off, he says they weren't reading from the fathers of the church. He says they were out on the golf course. That's what they were doing, he said. Uh, as far as the Roman calendar, Time would not allow me to enumerate all the changes John the 23rd did there. I'll just mention this one in particular. 
Every year we celebrate a feast called St. Peter's Chair at Rome. January 18th, St. Peter's Chair at Rome. That feast commemorates St. Peter uh, establishing Rome as his diocese and the diocese of all dioceses. John the 23rd abolished that feast. When I first realized that, why would he do that? Why would he abolish the feast commemorating St. Peter, the first vicar of Christ, establishing Rome as the center of Christ's holy faith? If you recall, when I gave you the biographical sketch of John the 23rd, he was anti-Roman. He despised Rome. He despised the, the very idea of Rome as the authority in the church. Remember, he wanted to break the Roman curia of their hold, as he put it, on the church. And my own personal opinion, he abolished this feast as an attack on Rome and the authority of the Roman Catholic Church over all other churches. He abolished as well the vigil of the Immaculate Conception. He abolished the octave days of Corpus Christi, the Sacred Heart. In regard to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, uh, he suppressed the recitation of the Nicene Creed on many feast days. You know, there's feast days that we celebrate in honor of certain saints we call doctors of the church. Doctors of the church, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, uh, St. Robert Bellarmine. And John the 20, we, on those feast days, we pray the Nicene Creed. Anytime we have a feast of the doctor of the church, we pray the Nicene Creed at that Mass. Because not all Masses during the week have the Nicene Creed. John the 23rd, for example, suppressed the recitation of the Creed on the Feast of Doctors of the Church. A most significant change was the abolishing of the recitation, I should say the praying, of the confitior and the absolution given by the priest before the communion for the faithful. As you know, during Mass, after the priest consumes the sacred host and he removes the pall off the chalice, he genuflects the servers, they rise, they genuflect, they go to the side, they get the communion paten. They ascend the step, they kneel down, and the priest consumes the precious blood. They bow down and they begin praying the confitior. And the priest turns around after, of course, he gives the absolution. John the 23rd abolished that confitior and that absolution before Holy Communion. But what is the most significant change that he made to the Mass was this. The addition of the name of St. Joseph to the canon of the Mass. Liturgists are agreed that the last noted change to the canon of the Mass was made by Pope St. Gregory the Great, who died in the year 604 A.D. The addition to St. Joseph's name to the canon was without any doubt thus far the boldest of all the changes made by this liturgical commission. And why do I say that? Because the canon had not been touched in 1,300 years. It was, as it were, fixed. It was so sacred and so venerable that no pope, not even the ones during the 
Renaissance ages that were more into art, so to speak, or they are accused of being more about the world than they were about the church, not even they would touch the canon of the Mass. The word canon comes from that Greek word, kanon. And in English, that word means rule. R-U-L-E, rule. And we use the word canon, it, it means that it's the rule by which priests must adhere in offering Mass, and in particular, in the consecrating of the body and blood of Christ. Interestingly, in the new Mass, they do not use the word canon. They don't use the word canon. That's gone. They use the word Eucharistic prayer. That's what they say now. Canon, rule, it's too rigid. They can have rigidness, right? So they use Eucharistic prayer, and they even offer in the new Mass, as we'll look at in a future conference here, three different Eucharistic prayers that they provide for the priest to use at his choice in the Mass. Bugnini and Antonelli, though, were really testing the waters on this one. The canon of the Mass begins when the priest says the Sanctus, 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 and the bells are rung three times. The canon ends when he says, Paromnia secula seculorum, and then Oremus, and he begins the Pater Noster. That part of the Mass had not been touched in 1300 years. But their test. Putting St. Joseph in the canon, it proved to be a success. The bishops, the clergy, and of course, the faithful looked at that and said, what could possibly be wrong with putting St. Joseph's name in the canon after the Blessed Virgin Mary? What could be wrong with that? Oh, it sounds good to me, right? (laughs) But in truth, We look back now, that change, as they said, was made to honor St. Joseph. It was not made to honor St. Joseph. Not at all. It was made to demonstrate that even the canon of the Mass, something so ancient, so venerable, could be changed. And once they established that principle, Once that was acceptable, that the canon of the Mass could be changed, they now had the green light, so to speak, to proceed even further. It's no mystery that Anibali Bugnini would call the 1962 Missal the bridge which opens the way to a promising future. I think about those words, the bridge which opens the way to a promising future. What's the promising future? What's he talking about? He's talking about the new Mass. The 1962 Missal is a big step for the new Mass. Now, with that, I feel constrained to make a few comments here in regard to the Society of St. Pius X. And I will speak more about this in a future conference, but since it's very relative now, I want to say that they have officially, their official position is they have adopted the 1962 Missal as their own. That's the Missal they officially use. That was one of the issues going back to 1983, when the nine priests, the then Father Kelly and the others, 
were expelled by Archbishop Lefebvre because they wouldn't use the 1962 Missal. The Society of St. Pius X adopts it as their own. It's their official Missal. And why would they do this? I don't know. Personally, I haven't... um, uh, My conjecture is one of the reasons why they did it was because the modernists in the Vatican could accept the 1962 Missal. It's the bridge to the promising future. They could accept that. They will not accept the Mass we offer here. It's unacceptable to them. It would never go. But they can accept the 1962 Missal. I mean, they do call it the Mass of Extraordinary Form now. We have what's called the so-called indult mass. It's the 1962 missal. But you know what I always found interesting is that the Society of St. Pius X rejects the mass promulgated by their own patron, Pope St. Pius X. His name is in the Roman missal we have. They reject that. And secondly... Some of the Masses many years ago that I attended in a Society of St. Pius X chapel, they do not adhere to the rubrics of that Missal. They don't follow it. Or, I have to say, from my own personal experience, what I saw in Chicago, what I saw in Cincinnati, what I saw in other places, different priests... They do some of the rubrics of the 1962 Missal, and then they all had the Confidior before Holy Communion, which is not in that Missal. It's not in their rubrics, but they put it in there. You know what that means? On their own authority, they are adding something to the rubrics of their Mass. You can't do that. You can't do that. It is no wonder that some priests have re- referred to their masses as the right of a cone and not the right of Rome. It's like they've made up their own missile. And again, that's my own personal experience, what I've seen. I personally saw that. On September 26, 1964, the Sacred Congregation of Rites under Paul VI issued an instruction. The instruction was called in English the first instruction on the orderly carrying out of the Constitution on the Liturgy. In the Latin, it is titled Inter Ecumenici, from the opening words of the document. We are now 1964. Vatican II is still going on. Before I gave you changes, 1960, 1962, before Vatican II really even got off the ground. Now we are in the midst of Vatican II. It's coming to the end. This instruction is issued. This document called for some very significant changes to the 1962 Missale Romanum. The changes called for by this instruction, though, went into effect on March 7th, 1965. And there are some liturgists who thus refer to this as the 1965 Missal. Why it's called the first instruction? Well, it's called the first instruction precisely because it was the first among others that would follow. In other words, inter ecumenici, 
is the first practical application of the Vatican II document I mentioned already, Sacrosanctum Concilium, which, as I said, Sacrosanctum Concilium is the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. Which Constitution called for a reform of the liturgy, the Mass, all the sacred rites of the Church. And you may remember that at Vatican II, I mentioned this to you last year, this constitution on the sacred liturgy, this document, Sacrosanctum Concilium, which was signed at Vatican II, it was the first of the 16 documents that was ratified by the bishops at the council. December 4th, to be exact, 1963, 2,147 bishops voted favorably for this Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. That is, they voted to have this Constitution promulgated so that the whole liturgy, the Mass, everything could be reformed, changed. Uh, By the way, only four bishops at Vatican II voted against it. Furthermore, Vatican II officially ended on December 8, 1965. But even before this day, the modernists, as it were, could not wait to begin, or I should more properly say, to continue their work of changing the Mass and the sacred rites as well as sowing among the bishops, the priests, and the faithful this spirit of change, that this was all good. My mother remembered uh, in the 1960s what she told me. She said things were like constantly changing. There was always something new going on each week. And all we heard from the pulpit, she would say, This is good. This is good. Father Cain, she said, would be saying to us, this is a good thing. This is good for the church. This is good for everybody. One thing after another. This is in the mid-1960s. There can be no doubt that the instruction inter ecumenici was a practical application of the Vatican II Constitution on the Liturgy. It opens with these words. Among the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council's primary achievements must be counted the Constitution on this liturgy. Since, you see, it regulates the most exalted sphere of the church's activity. And what are we talking about there? The most exalted sphere of the church's activity is the offering of the Mass. The document goes on to say, the document will have ever richer effects as pastors and faithful alike deepen their understanding of its genuine spirit and with goodwill put it into practice. This document, Inter Ecumenici, this first instruction, is divided into an introduction, five chapters, and the five chapters are all subdivided. It's a lengthy document. Most of them are. The document contains uh, some little changes that the faithful would, for the most part, be unfamiliar with. But then there are a number of changes that are very striking. Some of these changes were already made to the rite of Holy Week, and they're now being applied to the whole liturgy, to the Mass said throughout the whole year. And it's interesting to note that before, uh, at the conclusion of the introduction to this document, it states 
until the reform of the entire Ordo Mise, Order of Mass, the following points are to be observed. And then it goes through all these changes in the Mass. But notice it says, until the reform of the entire Ordo Mise. In other words, we've already got it stated here, the whole Mass is going to be reformed. It's going to be Change. Remember, they use the word reform. Change can frighten people. Reform sounds good. So what are some of these key changes to the Mass that were made in 1964? Here's one that was first I mentioned to you with the Rite of Holy Week. The celebrant is not to say privately those parts of the proper that are sung by the choir. The celebrant is not to say privately those parts of the proper that are sung by the choir. You're like, all right, well, what does that mean, right? Do you remember in Holy Week, the changes of the Holy Week? We mentioned how the reading of the 12 prophecies on Holy Saturday, the priest no longer had to read them all privately while somebody chanted them, while they had a lector chant them. He could go sit down now. What we're saying here is the priest can intone the Gloria at High Mass, Gloria in Excelsis Deo, and then he goes to sit down. He doesn't say the rest of it. When we offer the Mass and we intone the Gloria during a high Mass, the choir starts singing. But the priest reads the rest of the Gloria. Same thing with the Credo, the Nicene Creed. Credo and Unum Deum. He reads the whole thing. Then he goes to sit down while the choir sings. This says here, This isn't a counsel. This is, he is not. He's forbidden to say the prayer privately. He says, Gloria on excelsis Deo. Sings that, then he goes to sit down. Credo in unum Deum. Then he sits down. The choir says it. The people say it. The people say it. That's the point there. The people are being more active now. This instruction also also changed uh, the creed, and this would be very noticeable, Psalm 42 and the prayers at the foot of the altar are now abolished. They are now abolished. No more Psalm 42. When the priest says, Intro ibo ad altare dei, ad deum qui le tivigai juventute meam, judica me deum se deixene causa meam. And with the altar server, the altar boy, he's back and forth with that psalm. This this uh, instruction abolished Psalm 42. Um, the next most more significant change is the right of administering Holy Communion. You come to the altar to receive Holy Communion, the priest says, with the host making the sign of the cross, your own personal benediction. Corpus Domini Nostri, Jesu Christi, Custodiat Animam Tuum, and Vita Eternum, Amen. Right? The new manner discipline for administering Holy Communion, the priest is simply to do this. He is to hold the host before the communicant. He is to say, Corpus Christi, and then place it on their tongue. No blessing, and the formula is just Corpus Christi, the body of Christ. Whereas before it was made the body of our Lord, the body of our Christ, preserve thy soul into life everlasting. Amen. None of that. It's shorter. Remember, everything's about making it shorter. Everything's about making the Mass quicker, getting the people in and getting them on their way, so to speak.
This first instruction, inter ecumenici, also suppressed the reading of the last gospel at every Mass. Remember we said in Holy Week, Palm Sunday, no more last gospel was read at the Palm Sunday Mass. Now, at every Mass, there's no longer the last gospel of St. John will be read. And also, the Leonine prayers are now suppressed. No more Leonine prayers. These are among the major changes that were made in 1964. When you think about this, this is still five years before the new Mass. But this is already a destruction that was wrought upon the Mass and that was being introduced into the parishes. Okay. I'm going to stop there and just... I wanted to share something else with you along the same lines. Uh, When we pick up uh, next month, we'll get into the second instruction and we'll even get into the new Mass. But what I wanted to do in the last few minutes here is, while all of this is going on, I had uh, wanted to talk to you about this in the Vatican II conference, but I want to talk to you about the discipline and how it changed in seminaries and the formation of priests. This is an excerpt from a work called The Reformed Jesuits. And what it is, it compares the formation of Jesuits 1956 and what were the changes in discipline after Vatican II. Just so you can see how overnight, as it were, they changed the discipline of the formation of priests. And this, this may just, this is about the Jesuits, but nonetheless, it is applicable to all seminaries and religious formation for the most part. For the most part. This will give you as well, I believe, a greater appreciation for why uh, uh, why Bishop Kelly began the congregation of St. Pius V and how strict the discipline is at Immaculate Heart Seminary. And how um, how serious and how important is the formation of a priest and why we have to do what we do, why some of our priests are just uh, assigned, as it were, to just be at the seminary and not travel, but be at the seminary for the formation of the priests. It's so important. But here's what the Jesuit formation was for the novices. Uh, Here are some of the disciplines, and we're going to compare some of the disciplines. While waiting for the beginning of a conference or class, the novice must stand behind his chair. As soon as the professor enters, all books should be closed. In general, one is spoken to or speaks, he should raise, raise his hand and stand behind his chair. Novices are to spend ten minutes in preparing for their weekly confession. A five-minute thanksgiving should follow their confession. This is 1956. Novices may not cross their feet or legs in any manner. <laughs> you're not novices, so you're okay. <laughs> Ernie was like, oh, no. (laughs) Uh, Their posture should always manifest a calm composure and proper conduct becoming a religious. It is strictly forbidden to enter the cubicle of another novice. Any necessary talking, notice that word necessary, must be done at the entrance. That's one of our rules as well at Immaculate Heart Seminary. 
absolutely forbidden to enter the rooms of other seminarians. It is quite improper for young ladies to visit novices. A weighty reason alone could justify such a thing. This is a big one here. The cassock is to be worn at all times unless the contrary is explicitly stated. The cassock is the ordinary form of attire. It helps the novice to remember that he, by uh, his profession, is consecrated and dedicated to the special service of Christ. And it closes, the 1956 instructions for the novices closes with, We are in religion to strive after spiritual perfection. Therefore, our standard is that of the cross and not of the world. That's 1956. 1968. Novices may have access to newspapers to television for newscasts. In fact, Bishop Kelly said when he was at Immaculate Conception Seminary in Huntington here, and he was there in the late 1960s, he actually told me they were allowed to watch the TV for the newscasts. He said, but they were watching regular programs all the time, and nobody did anything. Nobody said anything. They were watching regular TV. Nineteen sixty nine. Uh, novices may stay up on Friday nights till one thirty in the morning. Rising time is six AM Monday through Friday, but Saturday and Sunday they can sleep in till eight o'clock. The uh, no special directives for watching television, anything goes. The use of the cassock is now required only when in liturgical functions in the chapel. Otherwise, the novice is free to dress as he wishes. He is suggested to wear black trousers, a black tie, and a white shirt for mass or when he goes to dinner in town. Goes to dinner in town. Leaves the seminary and goes out to dinner. The novice, the seminarian. He can just leave and go and go in the town to have dinner. Doesn't have to wear the cassock anymore. 1970. It is recommended that no one stay up past midnight on class days. There's no regular time for lights out. You know what time we have lights out for our summer? 9.45. 9.45 is lights out for them. Right? You know, sometimes, you know, younger people like to stay up late, right? I find that the older I'm getting, if I can be in bed earlier. <laughs> but then when you when you get up usually like 5, 5.30 in the morning, you know, it's, it just comes with naturally. Uh, 1973, there is no directive uh, for any time of going to bed. Uh, all visits are essentially approved. You know, visits from basically anybody, they're free to go out. They can have permission to smoke now, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Point is, the discipline changed. It was all, a, if you will, a package deal. The changes that were going on in the liturgy, the mass the sacramental rites of the church, the calendar. It was also changes going on at the same time in the discipline of the religious houses. They were destroying the formation and education of the priests. So that it's no wonder, it's no wonder in those early days after Vatican II that you had those priests who were uh, so favorable to all these changes. And how many times people tell me the personal stories 
Um, one lady just told me recently how they wanted to buy the cruci- they wanted to get the crucifix from their church that the priests threw in the trash. It was a beautiful wooden crucifix, beautiful image, corpus of Christ on there. They asked the priest if they could have it. He had it in the dumpster, but he said, hundred dollars you can have it. And they paid it. They paid it. The hundred that's that was his attitude. That's just one little story, but you can be sure. You can be sure. That was what was going on. The priest's formation and education had been changed. And this was not an accident. This was deliberate to destroy the priest. And the first thing that went from the priest was that idea for sanctity and spiritual perfection. That was gone now. That was gone. Okay, stand for prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, immaculate heart of Mary, St. Pius the Tenth, St. Pius the Fifth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Merry Christmas to everybody.